The idea for this event grew out of a trip that Barbara Huggins and I took to Conroe in February of this year. We drove to the Methodist Conference archives and Barbara had one question for me. Would the Cherokee County Historical Commission be interested in some items related to Lon Morris history? You can guess, I said yes, yes, and yes. But on the drive down, and once we arrived in Conroe at the archives, not even Barbara Huggins knew the extent of the wonderful historical items that we would bring back to the county. The conference archives had a great collection of Lon Morris history, and all the things you see this evening, they couldn't keep because of space. To illustrate the importance of preserving items, even if you're not exactly sure of the significance of an item, I have two illustrations this evening. The paintings you see displayed here. As Barbara and I were loading all the beautiful framed photos of college presidents and trustees that you've seen lined in the hallway tonight, Bill Hart, the archivist in Conroe, said, Deborah, in the next room there are some paintings. Would you like to see those? Yes, yes, and yes. I lovingly called her the lady in the blue dress. She was unknown at the time, but several people at the archives thought they might know who she was. Some guessed a trustee's wife, others guessed a faculty, but she was out of her frame, and there's some damage in the painting. But once we found the frame, we knew who she was. But even before I knew the significance, I knew we wanted to bring her back. Research tells us she's Eddie Skurlock's sister. He's the old man who was such a wonderful trustee and donor for the college. The large painting over here is my other example, the two paintings. I packed these right away. I knew they were beautiful and the religious painting was in this beautiful frame. As I'm loading it into the car, I discovered an envelope on the back of the painting. It was in a clear plastic bag and I could only decipher one name as I'm loading it into the car. And that one name was Nichols. Wow, I said. <laughs> Once back in Cherokee County, Barbara and I carefully unpacked and I read the note in the plastic bag. Senator Nichols' aunt, Joanne, painted that. I emailed the senator right away when I was home and told him of this lovely painting that we had brought back. He said in his email to me, we always wondered what happened to that. <laughs> and then he asked me about another painting of the Twin Towers. And I said, well, yes, I have that too. He said, my Aunt Joanne painted that one as well. I said, you're kidding. He said, get a flashlight and look carefully in the right-hand corner. And I did. I said, wow, again. She painted the Lon Morris Towers, the Twin Towers, while she was a student at the college in the 1930s. Many more discoveries have been made regarding the historical items that we brought back. And one exciting project has been started. We're calling it Lon Morris Remembered 2018. At the present time, our committee is composed of Falk Lander, you didn't know, but... <laughs> chairman of our committee, <laughs> but uh, Falk has been kind enough from the very beginning. Barbara and I went to his home and the three of us were a planning committee for this evening. But I haven't had a chance to tell Falk yet what an over 
Uh, we've just had more and more memories submitted since I visited with you last fall. So we have lots to collect. So we want all of you to join us in preserving Lon Moore's memories. One plan is to make a DVD. Uh, after all of this is over, collect more memories, videos, music, all of this will be on the DVD. To that end, around the corner here, we have a donation table. Um, if you feel so moved to put something in the donation jar, it will go towards the Lon Morris Remembered Project. Also on the table around the corner is uh, a sign-up sheet that May Lou Myers, wave at us, May Lou. She's, she's the archivist for the Methodist Church, and she is planning working on a book about Lon Mars, and she needs to know how much interest there is in such a book. So if you sign that signing, she, uh, May Lou will get back to you. In the printed program you have tonight, Barbara and I have tried to thank everyone. But there's a few people I want to say a special thank you to. Three members of my colleagues in the Historical Commission. Gordon Bennett, Elizabeth McCutcheon, and our chairman, Richard Hackney. We loaded up all of this stuff Thursday into our vehicles and moved it from Rusk here. I don't want to work for the Smithsonian, I don't think. <laughs> but we, we wanted to share what we had in our archives. I also want to thank tonight Janie Barber. She's a member of the Jacksonville Art Council and she helped with all of the displays. Special thanks must be extended to County Judge Chris Davis and the Commissioner's Court and the Historical Commission for sponsoring this event. Special thanks go to Jack Webb, would you wave at us, Jack, and his lovely wife are here tonight. Jack Webb purchased many of the buildings formerly known as Lawn Mars, and over the last month, Jack has been so kind to the Historical Commission and has donated items to us. Tonight, for this event, on your table, he donated the fans, the mugs, understand now how last night we all felt a little like it was the prom or homecoming we were decorating for this event. Um, also, I don't want to forget, and I'm going to stop at this moment to say about the wonderful donation. Mr. Loper, come to the mic, please. Where are you? My wife, Ruth Woods, and I graduated in 1962. And, uh, we bumped around the world a while and finally came back to East Texas and we go to the uh, Walton Grove United Methodist Church, which is a little mini church now. And uh, it, uh, the building was built in 1876. But one of our members in the final days of Walton Grove, she was working in the office there. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Our, one of our members uh, was working in Long Morris uh, in the final days, and uh, she was working in the office, and she found in the uh, trash piles a couple of items that uh, uh, she wanted to try and save. And this is one of them. Uh, this, we think, is the uh, window above the door of one of the door, one of the windows above one of the doors. If you look at your program, I never knew this, but you can see it's stained glass over the window. Look at the, uh, the picture of the Twin Towers, and you have two entrance doors, and uh, that was above one of the doors. We believe that was above the door at the old Twin Towers. 
and that came from from a trash pile. So we we were going to put it in our church and you know put backlighting behind it and this type of thing. But uh, our church is growing so small that we thought this would be the, the better thing to, to do is to donate it to the historic. authenticated as, as to what it is, but uh, uh, that's what we think it is. Thank you so much. But I must tell you, there's one group that has voiced concern, worried about my involvement in this effort. Mixon First Baptist Church. <laughs> They're afraid I'm becoming a Methodist. <laughs> I've assured my congregation the only time I'm a Methodist is when Barbara Huggins calls me to work on a project. <laughs> Without further ado, let's welcome our MC for the evening, Barbara Huggins. We thank all of you for coming. After the program tonight, we're going to ask you to group by decade with your class members. <laughs> Yeah, like 1960 here, 70, 50, 40, whatever, and we'll make a picture of you with your group. <clears throat> but tonight we remember Longmars College, and uh, you may wonder how we got here. But I wanted to share just a part of the story, sort of the backstory to what Deborah told. Some of it has come together, and some of it continues to come together and we'll put it all together eventually. Originally, the Texas Annual Conference had their archives over it. <laughs> My grandson Cooper is helping me. <laughs> the archives of the Texas Annual Conference were over at Lakeview Methodist Assembly, and I believe uh, Dr. Gordon Alexander was one of the Methodist ministers that was prominent in keeping that together. <clears throat> Eventually, those archives were moved to Longmars College, and they became part of the Dorn Moss archives in the library at Longmars. Then, later, they occupied other spaces around the school, and that's a story for another day. When Longmars closed suddenly in 2012, there was a mad scramble to save not only the archives, but many Longmars College items, and there were several people, not in an organized manner or concerted effort, but operating more or less independently, trying to come together to save what we could. The alumni group, I know um, Helen Music and her friends, and um, oh, I'm trying to think, Midge going, they worked on the archives. <clears throat> There was a group, Falk and, and Jimmy Reese and um, Jack Albright, that went to the chapel, tried to save pictures and artifacts and hymnals that were there. Other groups went to the library and tried to save some of the books, the Methodist books that were there. Um, <laughs> Sam Hopkins was scrambling to get things for the Vanishing Texana Museum and the public library here. Um, as a result of that, um, you might be interested to know that the hymnals in the chapel went to the Rush State Hospital and to Wiley College. Many of the yearbooks are with the Banishing Texan Museum, the Public Library, uh, um, archives at, SAM, uh, at SFA, and at Bridwell Library in Dallas. Things were um, distributed wherever we could find a home for them. Some of the furniture went to Lakeview and then went to various churches. The uh, baptistry that was in the chapel went to the Russ, uh, First Methodist Church and is, is there today. Well, anyway, 
All of this stuff was gathered up, and you may wonder what was done with it. Falk and Bill Hart were instrumental in renting three storage buildings north of Jacksonville, where the Lon Morris artifacts and the Texas Angel Conference archival material were still, uh, stored for several years. How long, Falk? How many years do you remember? Oh, at least three years. <clears throat> About three years or so. July 2010 to February 2017. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. In, in, February, in February of 2017, we got word that Elijah Stanzel from the conference office was sending the biggest U-Haul truck I've ever seen to Jacksonville to gather all of this stuff up. And there were about 10 or 12 volunteers from this church under the direction of Falk and others. Some of y'all that helped with that, raise your hand. I know there's several, yeah. Maurice, Meg, Jimmy, um, I think some of the kitchen crew uh, all helped. And you know, in about an hour's time, we loaded three storage units into that U-Haul truck, and it was on its way to Houston, actually Conroe, where our new archives building was almost completed. Well, since it wasn't all, all the way completed, we were allowed to put the stuff in the mission center there in Conroe, and that was fine. There was lots of room, but no problem, and gradually, Bill Hart and other volunteers were working through all of this, getting it into the archives in a proper manner. All of a sudden, Harvey hit, and they said in the mission center, y'all need to get this stuff out of here because we need our space. So again, volunteers flew in and uh, moved things to the archives building. And if you haven't seen our new archives building down there, sometime when you're going to Conroe, stop in. It's on the east side of Conroe. It's quite a nice facility. So Bill Hart then was going through things in Conroe, looking at this massive pile of things, and he said, Barbara, we can't have all this stuff in the archives. Some of it is an archival material, and the other thing is there's just so much of the long stuff. Do you have do you have a clue of what we could do? Do you have an idea of what we could do? And I was thinking and I thought, well, let me ask a friend. So I called Deborah and I said, Deborah, would the Cherokee County Historical Commission be interested in bringing some of the lawnmowers things back to East Texas, back into Cherokee County? And she said yes before I got the question out of my mouth. So I was thrilled to death. Bill Hart was thrilled to death. And I think all of you lawnmowers people ought to be thrilled to death. <laughs> that lawnmowers things have come back. So tonight is a result of rescuing so many of the Long Morris materials. Yes, tonight we remember Long Morris. Not only do we remember it, Long Morris is a part of so many of us. A part of who we are and a part of who we always will be. So we're delighted tonight to remember Long Morris. Tonight our invocation, invocation will be given by Dr. Jimmy Reese who taught at Lon Morris, served as chaplain at Lon Morris, a teacher par excellence, and we welcome him to do our invocation. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, O God, for bringing us together as people who share in a common memory. Our memories are different they are all dear to us. We give thanks to you for the experience of attending, teaching, and supporting the Mont Morris College. We miss her deeply. We give thanks to you tonight for those who have shared in bringing this meeting to fruition. And for those who have labored to help us in our memories, we are grateful. And we give thanks for the food this night, which always reminds us of our need for you and for one another. Amen. Our next speaker is a son of this church, First Methodist Church. 
He's a prominent senator in our state. He's a member of the Nicholas family, many of whom attended Long Morris College through the years. And later, many of them, including Robert, have served on the board of trustees and have been very avid supporters of the college. Tonight, we welcome Robert Nichols. Can everybody hear me in the back? Does anybody even want to hear me in the back? <laughs> okay, well, it's great to be here. Uh, we were at stiff competition because this is the official opening of McDonald's. If you go by that place, it's just stacked all over. Uh, anyway, a lot of people have put on, did a lot of work to get us here today, saving these materials and stuff, and it's, we're all deeply appreciated. Uh, appreciate the, those of you who did that work. My grandfather, uh, Louis Weber Nichols, attended Lon Morris in 1915. That was 103 years ago. Uh, he wanted to become a Methodist minister. And uh, he did uh, for over 50 years. And when he moved here in 1915, he brought his wife, my grandmother, and he brought their young baby son, my father, Tally W. Nichols. And so uh, when he graduated Lon Morris, became a minister, he went to Gallatin, a little Gallatin right down the street. He was a, I think he referred to it as a circuit minister. Does that make sense, Paul? Because I don't think Methodist Church had the structure like it does uh, now, but they were kind of on their own. You were signed, but you were kind of on your own. And he preached at really two or three churches over there. And uh, I'm going to come back to Gallatin in a little bit because Gallatin connects to these paintings up here. Uh, but he worked in the East Texas Circuit and went to places like you know Elysian Fields, Marshall, Livingston, Sour Lake, Beaumont. Uh, uh, in the 1930s, he came to Jacksonville to be the minister of the First Methodist Church and during the Great Depression. And uh, I think it was a tradition that whoever the local minister was automatically became on the board of the Von Morris College. And so he actually was on the board of Von Morris in the 1930s. And he always told me with great pride, Dr. Mann, you may not know this, he, uh, that he was on the selection committee when they hired Dr. Peters. Oh, wow. Now, that's way back. <laughs> he said that was his greatest contribution to the college <laughs> when they chose that because he chose a good one. Um, in the 1950s, uh, he preached in Rust also. In the 1950s, he came back, I think he was a superintendent, if I'm using right, for this area. Uh, the Methodist Church, and as such, it was kind of tradition that the superintendent for the area also be on the board. So that it, he was back on the Lawn Morris board again. I think that was in the 1950s. And then in the 1960s, my father, Tally Weber Nichols, uh, uh, became on the uh, board. Um, and he served for, I think, about 15, 20 years, something like that. And then by the time that we got it rolled around through the 80s, I think I went on the board late 80s served probably about 20 years until I was elected to the Senate and it was, I, I was there for a little bit. But my dad always told me a funny story when, uh, with Eddie Skirlock. I think, do we sign that with his daughter? It's his sister. Sister? It's his sister. Um, anyway, Eddie Skirlock, as we all know, uh, was on the board, and but he also was a great financial contributor and his family was forever. Uh, went, uh, so they had a great connection with Lawn Morris College. And Dr. Peoples realized, I'm not going to get a little bit off here, but I'm going to be pretty close. And my father told me, he said, they realized they were $600,000 short. This is back in the 70s. So it would be like half, you know, a uh, million and a half, two million short or something like that. So Eddie Scurlock told everybody to come down to Houston, come to his oil business. And, 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 and so they did. And the board members, people from Lawn Morris, and they were all lined up, and there was his desk, and my dad said, Eddie Skirlock said, okay, we have got to raise $600,000 today. Today. He says, I'm gonna write a check for $150,000. He got his check out. First guy in line said, you can count on me, I'm writing a check for $75,000. Next guy said, 
I'm going to write a check for $30,000 and I'll pledge two more checks over the next number of months. Fourth guy in line said, I think I'm in the wrong line. <laughs> I always thought that was funny. Uh, I'm in the wrong line. So about 19 Nicholses have attended Lon Morris College. I know my grandfather had two sons, two daughters. My uncle, which is my dad's brother, uh, served in the ministry. He attended Lon Morris. Every one of them went to Lon Morris at one time or another. They may not have graduated from there, but they went to Lon Morris. He became a Methodist minister. And it's confusing because his name is Lewis W. Nichols as well. And so I have a brother named Lewis W. Nichols and my grand, great grandfather, same name, and the, and the names and the nephews and nieces. And so people ask me sometimes, are you kin to Lewis Nichols? And I say, yes, which one? <laughs> uh, but there are about 19 of us that have attended over a period of about 100 years. And um, this painting, um, Deborah wanted me to talk about this painting. And so, um, this, particularly this one right here, the tower I get tickled about because uh, when I was a kid, that tower was still there. It was old, it's kind of probably dangerous. I don't think there were any staircases going up to the top of the towers and stuff. But you know, kids, we've got to go there. If it's there, we've got to go. So we would sneak in and we would affix ropes and things like that. We'd get to the very tip top of those towers. It was something we just had to do. So I used to do that all the time. But as you said, my Aunt Joanne, who was uh, Reverend De you know, Nichols's daughter, one of the two daughters, uh, painted that while she was in college. She was a great artist, and uh, all her life she played music for the church. She was an organist. She painted professionally, uh, and she would sell her paintings. Sometimes they would commission them, and we'd kind of go, how, how do you get so much money for those paintings? She said, people like my painting. She traded, uh, somebody traded her a lake lot on Lake Livingston for one of her paintings to give you kind of a scale of what we're talking about. So they're pretty valuable. And so she had some she really liked, so she kept. And as she got older and older and her income dropped and dropped, and finally everybody in her family, including her daughter, had passed away and it was just kind of us. And we're, you know, and then the distant royalties like herself. And so she ended up with just a few possessions and she kept them in that nursing home and, and this was one of them. She loved that painting and she didn't really want to part with it. But we would visit her in the nursing home and she would tell me, I'll tell you the story behind it and then uh, one day she told me, she said, I, I want people to see this painting. I'm not going to be here much longer and I want you to give it to Long Morris College because I went there great school, people will see it. She believed in the mission of the college. And she said, but I also want you to tell them a story. So there's two stories here. First story is the history of, of the actual painting itself. What is this? She ran across a, a, an ancient poster somewhere, faded, torn, ragged, and it was a poster of this, of Jesus when he was a, a boy. And she took it to an art historian and he said he had never seen that painting. He didn't even know it existed. And so, I'm not saying she did the greatest research in the world, but you would think an art historian would know a religious art if that was there. So, she felt like it was important that that be saved. So she spent a lot of time taking that and, and recreating it. So it's not an original uh, concept, but it is, hand, it is her hand painting of that and try to keep it alive. You, they, you just don't see many pictures of Jesus when he was a little boy. But she also told me that when she was a little girl she was born in Galatia. And she was delivered at the house. So she ended up with no birth certificate. All her life she had no birth certificate. So when she had social security age you can imagine the problem you have trying to prove that you're alive and things like that. And she was finally able to prove she was alive and uh, uh, that helped. But when she was a little girl, one of the strong memories that she remembered was that um, they were, didn't have any money. And my granddad would preach. He was too um, proud to go ask for food or beg for food. And they got hungry. And she said, 
we were hungry and there was absolutely nothing to eat. And my grandmother began crying because she couldn't feed the children. And so she said that my grandmother got on her knees in Galton and prayed for food. And then she heard a noise. And they looked out into the yard and a rabbit got caught in a fence. A rabbit got caught in a fence. She got that rabbit, she skinned it, she cooked it, the egg, and she said the Nichols have never been hungry since. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a good prayer. But she said, I want you to tell that story. And so I didn't know when the appropriate time was, but she wanted this to go to Long Morris College. And so when I took it, I knew that years later, people would not remember the story, they would not remember who painted the painting, who was this lady, or anything like that. So I took an envelope, I didn't realize it was a clear one. I took, I wrote the story, typed it out, to make it a little more in there. Um, I took a picture of her with the painting, which are pictures of her, and I wrote the story, I made multiple copies, and I taped that on the back of that painting. And sure enough, that's kind of what saved that painting, was that envelope I stuck on the back. And because uh, when Lon Norris did close and everything disappeared, uh, we were still having family dinners with my mom and made it to be over 100 years old. And we would sit around wondering what happened to Aunt Joanne's paintings. You know, what happened to those things? And so, uh, now we know. Uh, and so I appreciate the opportunity to share that with you. And I appreciate the opportunity to share that story my aunt um, told me. And uh, it's great to see all y'all here today. Next speaker is a former president of Lon Morris College. Um, I can tell you so many Paul Landrum stories. <laughs> Not all of them related to Lon Morris, but anyway, our families have taken so many vacations together and shared so many good times and all. But tonight, we want Falk to come as the past president of Long Morris College and share with us some of his memories, experiences, uh, whatever he wants to tell us. Long Morris, uh, uh, Falk is retired now, lives over in Athens, and he's brought his wife, Eleanor, with him tonight. Can't wait to tell my friends in Athens I got a sitting ovation. <laughs> I tried to make some notes. Uh, Barbara had said uh, about six minutes. Uh, we won't turn off the mic till nine minutes. <laughs> so uh, my notes are a little confusing. It's just overwhelming. It's such a joy to see so many of you here, so many people that I've known for a long time. I I'm impressed with how many people came in Lon Norris Garb. <laughs> I, I, I saw. Uh, Pitt Adamson, and she had the shirt that uh, that five couples of us always wore to go various places and, and have a great time. Uh, you're here because you remember the community that was Lon Morris. Uh, a couple of factoids that many people don't know. Uh, Jim Crawford did a detailed study and found that between uh, 1900 and 1996, more uh, Lon Morris students, uh, that Lon Morris put more ministers into the Texas Conference than any other institution, including SMU, Perkins as a separate entity in Southwestern. Uh, I, I didn't know that. Uh, another factoid that many people don't know, U.S. News and World Report every year publishes a book, America, a magazine, America's Best Colleges. And in 1989, they named three two-year colleges in the United States. And one of the three was Lon Morris because of the academic standards. <laughs> we had a faculty that was much better than the salaries we could pay. I, I don't know how they lived on that. <laughs> I, had, I had the easy job raising money. Um, Virgil Matthews had to cope with academic things, and Richard Burton, bless his heart, had to 
cope with students <laughs> who thought they knew more than everybody. They were freshmen after all. Um, I, I wrote some notes here so I wouldn't go over my time. Uh, but I want to talk about that faculty. Um, I don't guess there's a, a more, a better natural born teacher than Jimmy Reese. He just, he was exceptional in that regard. Um, I, I worked with Dale Dotson when he was the basketball coach and it was, it was interesting to see how much he was interested in the character, the academic discipline of the players on the basketball team. You don't see that everywhere. There's a lot of information in the news now about basketball players being bought and sold by the big basketball mills. He was an absolutely honest man. Uh, I could talk about the, the people who supported the college. Uh, Tally Nichols was a good friend of mine. One summer, uh, June and I toured Europe with uh, Tally and Ruth had a wonderful time. I've been privileged in my lifetime to know three men that could definitely be called Renaissance men who had an interest and a skill in virtually everything they saw. And one of those was Telly Nichols. I want to talk about my friends that I knew in old London Hall uh, one of the guys said, I'm sure this is probably not true, it's probably made up. He said that when he came to school that the uh, dorm master had a book and he had to sign in. And he said that as he started to sign in, a roach ran across the book. <laughs> and he refused to move in. He said, when they come to see which room you're taking. <laughs> another name, Francis Harris. Um, Brian Garrison said to me one day that between kindergarten and graduating from the Wharton School of Business, arguably the most prestigious business school in America, the best teacher he had in his whole life was Francis Harris. So there were people that, that earned twice what we could pay them. Um, I want to talk about donors. Uh, they wouldn't let me print money. Um, <laughs> so we had to rely on donors. And over that 16 years that I was there, foundations and corporations and individuals, uh, philanthropists, gave $24 million for uh, scholarships, for operating expenses, for buildings, and so on. Uh, it was a lifeline. The, uh, financially, Lon Morris, for 158 years, was always on the brink. Uh, we always seemed to just keep our nose above water. Uh, so donors were critically important. Uh, Tally Nichols was a donor, but he was also an encourager of others to donate. Uh, Eddie Skurlock did that. Uh, Eddie Skurlock opened doors in Houston that I couldn't get through. Uh, I, I had tried to get into Houston Endowment, and I was visiting Mr. Skurlock and said, well, I just haven't been able to get an appointment at all. And he said, he picked up his phone and said, Melba, get me Howard Creekmore on the phone. <laughs> well, I got to see Howard Creekmore that afternoon, and every year after that, that I was at Lon Morris, they contributed for scholarships for youngsters in Harris County. So, so that was a great step in the right direction. Uh, times have changed, as you well know, and student life has changed. We were a community largely because virtually no one had a car. There was one phone in London Hall, one phone in Lula Morris Hall. Uh, we didn't jump in the car and run to Tyler because we didn't have a car. Uh, so we talked to each other. Uh, when I moved back to Jacksonville and taught part-time in the philosophy division, I would walk over to the atrium at Moody and the students all had the earbuds in and they're doing this. Uh, so 
they aren't better or worse people. It's just a different life circumstance. That's all. Uh, I saw a cartoon a few days ago. There's a, there are two elderly ladies. They look like they're nearly as old as I am. And one of them had her phone and had the cord, of course, going to that base unit. And she said to her friend, Myrtle, I do not understand it. My granddaughter says I can watch movies on my phone. <laughs> and that largely encapsulates how student life circumstances have changed. But they're still young people. They still need an education. I want to mention one more thing, and that is the joy of meeting a lot of alumni. Uh, Mary Lizzie Martin was one of our generous contributors, lived in uh, Carthage. She was Mary Lizzie Hemby when she was a student here. She was the football sweetheart in 1925. One of her boyfriends was Ray Loden. Anyone in the room remember Ray Loden? Yeah, okay, I knew Mike would, uh, who was a prominent leader among the clergy of the Texas Conference. He graduated, but maybe the summum bonum of all, you pay all the tuition, you work these words in somewhere. <laughs> maybe the best visit I ever had was in 1979, I went over to Kilgore when the State Historical Society was dedicating the site where Alexander College had been before it moved to Jacksonville. And I had the opportunity to visit with America Harris Woodley. Uh, she uh, graduated in, 18, uh, in 1879. Uh, I'm, yeah, 18, she was born in 1876, graduated in 1894. She was 103 years old. She could barely, barely hear if you got it, kind of like me, if you got it real close. And her eyesight was reading, but her mind was surprisingly sharp. And if I could have another minute and a half, <laughs> she said that uh, every evening, uh, they would all go down to Dr. Alexander's apartment. Dr. Dr. and Mrs. Evans, she was the matron, they called them in those days, the matron of the girls' dormitory. The boys boarded in town at that time. And they would all go down to the little two-room apartment that the Alexander's had, and they would kneel for evening prayer and then go to their rooms. They, they couldn't all get into the sitting room, so some of them had to kneel in the bedroom. And she said, Dr. Alexander, in the fall, kept a, basket, a, a box of pears warping, uh, uh, ripening under his bed. So we would try to kneel near the bed. <laughs> and while we got some nourishment for the soul, <laughs> we would also get some nourishment for later on. She said that she met her husband, Mr. Woodley, at Alexander. She said, of course, we were not uh, allowed to date, pause, but we managed. <laughs> so, so whether you graduated in 18, 7, 1894 or 1950, whenever it was, our, our hearts are broken that Lon Morris is gone, but we have hearts full of great memories. First thing they did when I was sworn in as county judge years ago was kick me off the board. <laughs> and they said I couldn't be judging on the board too, but I, I think it's because they wanted to put me to work. And, and we have the most rich, diverse history here in our county. And I, I believe we have the best people you could ever find to help preserve it. We never know. You, you see the passion that was put into saving Lon Morris. I remember when Deborah Burkett came in my office and she said, we've got all this stuff and, and, and we've got to save it. Will you help us? And then, yeah, I'll help you. I'm, I'm running battles for space now between the election department and uh, the district clerk and everyone in our building we have, but we, we've got to save the history so uh, we went to work trying to find a place for it and 
the same passion that they have for preserving the history of Lon Mars College. Uh, last week, someone called in the uh, uh, Nazi prisoner of war marker had been broken off out on Highway 294 out of Alto. And I called Deborah and said, Deborah, I just want to tell you, I'm, I'm going to go get that marker. It, it, it'll get lost. And she said, I'll meet you down there. So we're on 294 next to the road. She's in the middle of the road taking pictures. And I'm thinking, log truck's going to swerve to miss her and kill me. <laughs> It went on forever, but uh, the marker is now fixed. And, and the, the passion of these people, when, when they come in the office, you just instantly go to work. You can't say no to them. Uh, Dr. Hackney was there. He was working on a, a lynching memorial. And he put me straight to work. And, you know... We're trying to research this old, old history. And uh, so I'm, I'm out asking questions and, and trying to find out where, where all of our history, good or bad, we are working hard to preserve it and save it for future generations. And, and I'm not gonna go on very long tonight, but I, I just wanted to say, uh, Mon Morris, College, one of the names that was driven in my head being a member of the Hawkham family and marrying into the Hawkham family also was uh, Zula Hawkham Pearson. And for years and years, <laughs> growing up, I just thought Lon Morris was a big theater with this great lady <laughs> and all these plays. I'm so excited to find out there was so much more. And, uh, later, I had two of my sons attended for a while at Lon Morris, and both of them loved their experience there. But uh, Deborah Burkett called the other day about moving this big bail. I get all the calls for really strange stuff, but the <laughs> Cherokee County Historical Society just absolutely keeps me on my toes every day because you never know what you're going to be doing. But they're always working to save our history, and and we love them, and 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 I hope they continue it up. And Shelley Cleaver, I, I don't think he's a walking encyclopedia of Cherokee County history, and you can believe a lot of it. <laughs> Anyway, I'm not going to go. I just got three minutes, and, and, and I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm so proud this has been preserved. It was something well worth preserving, and I, I'm sure wherever it is, we'll take good care of it. Thank y'all. Well, good evening. It's always great to be the last speaker. <laughs> Especially when you're following a senator, a college president, and a judge. <laughs> so the lowly banker gets to stand up and talk a little bit about his long horse experiences. I'd actually had a, about an hour and a half presentation prepared. <laughs> Once I realized that this meeting this evening was going to be held here at my church, I had to cut it back to about four or five minutes. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to believe that 40 years has passed. It's, uh, golly, and I was just looking at Chris, I think I look a lot better. Uh, you know, I gotta tell you something, I'll digress just a moment. Judge Davis does an awesome job, as we all know, as a county judge here. But um, more important than that is his lovely wife, Diana, who happened to be a sorority sister to my wife, Sharon. So now you know uh, the rest of their story. And we all went to school together 40 years ago. And I've remained friends all these years, and they're wonderful people. So great job that you do, Chris. And Janet, also, and your boys are wonderful as well. So uh, you know what? When we got people like that running the county, you move to College Station. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't even rehearsed. <laughs> oh, my goodness.
goodness. Um, you know, I was just a 17-year-old kid from the Houston area, and I had no idea what I wanted to do, and I still don't all these years later. And coming to a little small Methodist college tucked away up here in beautiful East Texas just changed my life completely. When um, Barbara called me and asked me about that, I didn't really know what to expect, but I thought this is going to be interesting. And then Deborah, whom I've known for many years, ever since she actually uh, retired and moved to Cherokee County, I, I, Deborah Burkett is a wonderful treasure, as well as Barbara, that we have here. Uh, that, you know, let's recognize him. Even though I'd probably like to be at the Haggy game tonight, I just could not tell them no. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really great to be here. And when I was asked to say a few words about my experiences and my memories at Lawn Morris, uh, I thought about what was most important. And I, the first thing I came up with was my grades. But as Dr. John Ross and uh, Richard Burton and Dr. Reese, let's see, who else uh, taught me that's uh, here? Well, Falk, that's another story for another day. <laughs> they realized that it did not come a lot worse for my grades. But uh, just, matter of fact, Falk, you just came to Long Morris uh, just about a year or two when I became a student there and I almost managed to get him run out of town. But as you know, he's, he lasted. We, uh, the, the, the business manager at the time was a gentleman named Terry DeCruz. And Terry DeCruz somehow got nominated as the business manager for no extra money and, uh, to become the first golf coach Long Morris had in many years. So he was charged with recruiting golfers. So I get a call from Terry, and uh, I, I played on the golf team in high school, and I said, wow, this opportunity to go to East Texas and play on the golf team, this is great, I'm gonna be big time. Well, he never even bothered to watch me play, he just said, come on up, we're gonna give you a scholarship. <laughs> and I believe in our, well, I know in our first year, I think we finished out of last place one tournament, Falk, which was good, that was good, we came in next to last. Uh, and, but fortunately, we started the tradition. Sandy Terry uh, continued that tradition of, of, of going to the national championship on more than one occasion. So we started that, Sandy. I'm glad you got to finish it. <laughs> but uh, so just very briefly, a, a, a memory that I'll share about that. We actually were invited because they needed the teams to fill up a regional tournament down in Laredo, Texas my sophomore year. And on our way, we decided we'll stop in Huntsville and practice at the Waterwood Club that was there many years. I think it's since closed. But So we stopped there, and we noticed there were some canoes, some loose canoes right there next to the golf course. So we decided, instead of practicing, you know, Coach DeCruz just goes on up to the tee, and we're not there. He can't find any tee. We decided to have canoe races instead of practice golf. So Coach DeCruz comes all the way back over, and uh, it is typical form, he's yelling and screaming at us. And, um, and so he decides the best thing for him to do is to hop in the canoes with us. So he gets in, and before you know it, he's having a hard time balancing, and next thing you know, here he goes this way, and well, as uh, you can imagine, the rest is history, and Coach DeCruz is no longer the college golf coach of Long Morris. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, you know, our years, I, I first came in 1978 to Long Morris. We had a number of students at that time, gosh, 300 plus students. I uh, felt sorry for me and encouraged me to come and be a part of, of this college experience that was Long Morris. Uh, coming out of a, a larger high school down the Houston area, I had no idea what to expect coming to a small school. Fortunately, like I said earlier, it changed my life. It was something that ended up meaning so much more to me because if there's one word that can describe Lon Morris, it would be relationships. And to, to, this, to this day, I would say the closest relationships that many of us I know in here and, all, and, and, and that I have to this very day, all these years later, are my classmates from Lon Morris College. Uh, I think if I count up, I probably attended five other colleges. It took me a while. I majored in fraternity when I came to Lon Morris. And so it, it, it took me some time to finish. However, if I had not had the opportunity to attend Lawn Morris, I know that I would have never finished my education. And one of these days, I keep thinking I'm going to become a big-time banker like Todd Burton over here is, a big-time banker. And, uh, but I've still got a ways to go. I had someone ask me recently, said, well, how long have you been in banking? I said, well, I started in 1980, about 10 years ago, and they looked at me sort of funny. 
And I said, I know it's 38 years, but I've really only worked a total of 10 of those years, if you add it all up. Uh, but, you know, for, for what Lon Morris meant to everybody, we will have that long after we're all gone. Uh, the artifacts that, that are here are just fantastic. I just cannot get over the work that has gone into this, both uh, Deborah and Barbara and everyone on the Historical Commission. Uh, this is fantastic that we're now going to be able to have this officially preserved and recognized. Uh, you know, these are forever memories. We'll have forever friends. We'll be forever grateful for the opportunities that we've all had to be a part of Lon Morris College. I, I really learned how to communicate. Those of you who know me know that I'm not too shy on words. Uh, as a banker, my favorite word is no. We always start there. But, you know, I really learned how to gain confidence and learn how to communicate at Lon Morris College. I had Frances Bell Harris as a teacher. Uh, I think she felt sorry for me as well and just got tired of me and finally sent me on. But it, it, it Lon Morris enabled me to pursue my career as a banker. I certainly was not going to be pursuing a career as a golfer. But uh, when, I was, uh, when I was asked to do this, I was so excited to hear about this and about all the artifacts that have been collected. And, uh, and what, a, what a wonderful thing it is to preserve all this that has had such a positive impact on so many people in Cherokee County uh, and across the world. Again, none of this would have been possible without De Deborah and Barbara and the work that the Historical Commission has put in. Um, thank you for the archives and, and their support uh, in getting all this done and put together. And this little tidbit that came in from the Twin Towers is just uh, incredible. But uh, I'll just leave you guys with one thought because we all know this, that with Lawn Morris College, once a Bearcat, you're always a Bearcat. So always remember that, and uh, God bless all of you. Thank you for having me. It's been a delightful evening, and again, we thank all of you for coming. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed getting it together.